Okay. Right, the next, I'll close that one. The next uh, question is, <laughs> where are you? Okay, this will be an interesting one. Because we've got people based in the Scottish Islands, people with an interest in the Scottish Islands, and people based on islands in other places um, with very relevant and interesting things to say about island futures. And already you can see the spread. Spoken Aotearoa are pulling a late one. Yep, please do. <laughs> okay. This shows the global spread of the island studies and interest in islands. And uh, thank you, everyone, from all the different areas for having come here today for this this event. OK, so if everyone has done that, we'll deactivate the poll. OK. And then the next one, open text, give you a little bit of time for this. What's your main research or professional focus? Um, again, it will give us a, a wonderful overview of um, who we are today. And just take some time to have a look at what other people have said. I feel like you've got music in the background or something when this is <laughs> empty. Uh, um, em it's not empty sound, but you know what I mean. There's sort of a, a gap when nothing is is being said. So there we go. Should not nominate a person to tell a joke every time, Andrew. Tell a joke or sing a song or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, exactly. Have a, have a proper Kaylee. <laughs> so twenty-one votes. There we go. So I think you can see what a, a range of people we have uh, here today with a wide range of interests and coming from different, <clears throat> different backgrounds as well. Andrew, it's also interesting how people defined their location in the previous question so some of us chose an island some of us chose a city some of us chose a region uh it, it, yes. it deserves uh, some further scrutiny i think it does so we, we could come back to that um uh, shortly let's let's do that because uh, what i want to do is everyone to take a, a minute to just introduce themselves and see where the where they are 
you know, which of these different destinations you've actually come from and uh, which of these interests are yours as well. So we get some, uh, a little bit more detail in that. Okay, so I think we can close that just now. And the third one is, um, no, we've done that. Okay, right. Let's let's take a, a, a short um, time now, everybody, to say who you are and um, where you are and what your interest is. But just keep it very short because we want to, um, you know, we want to move things on. But I want to sort of put faces to the places and put faces to the the interests as well. And it gives you a chance to to say something so that uh, again it breaks the ice for uh, later on um, in the day. So um, I'm, I've got everybody's face here on the screen. So I will uh, just point somebody and, and say uh, you have a minute to tell us uh, who you are and uh, where you are. And I first person I can see on the screen is Terry. Hi, Terry. Good morning. I'm on the Isle of Mull. I'm sorry I joined slightly late. I'm not accustomed to this particular medium and I can't find where everybody was contributing their answers to your questions because I missed your introduction. But that's all right. I'll catch up during the course of the morning. I'm a director of the Scottish Islands Federation and I'm freshly retired from running a community transport scheme on the Isle of Mull. Excellent. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, Leanne, um, hopefully can uh, just point you to how to find um, the Slido. It's, it's on apps down at the bottom. It is, but I'll, I'll message Terry directly via the chat. Uh, smashing. Thanks, Leanne. Anyway, great to see you, Terry. I hope the weather's nice in Mull. Um, okay. The only time I've been in Mull, I've had two weeks of rain. So there we go. And next, I can see a Kirsten. Kirsten Gow. Hello everyone, nice to see new faces and familiar faces. Uh, my name's Kirsten and I live in the Isle of Jura. Um, I'm an islander and an island researcher. Um, I am a PhD student with the University of Aberdeen and uh, James Hutton Institute, uh, funded by Macaulay Development Trust. And my focus of my research is the island's diaspora and return migration. Um, I'm a, a, a co-opted board member of CIF uh, and I'm also involved with the European Small Island Network. I'm also a director of Isle Develop um, and a director of our local community owned shop on the island. So I'm here at many levels. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kirsten. And uh, Kirsten is also the first uh, um, um, uh, conference presentation bomber that uh, we've ever met. She appeared in the conference in, in Shetland with a ready made presentation um, out of the blue, and we managed to, to fit her in, and it was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, and next we have Anna. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Anna Bowen. I'm a research fellow at the SRUC, currently based in Edinburgh. I'm also an honorary uh, fellow at the Charles Darwin University in Australia. My research interest is in sparsely populated areas and rural development through migration patterns. So I'm kind of interested in observing how migration patterns are shaping communities and landscapes in these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Nice to see you. And um, Adele. Hi, Adele. Hello there. Apologies, I had a um, island internet issues for a minute there, but I'm back. So. Um, yeah, I'm currently doing um, a PhD research into the implementation and impact of the Scottish National Islands Plan um, on the uh, islands um, in Scotland, and particularly um, relationships and how uh, discourses around um, how we govern ourselves or otherwise <laughs> is prominent and the different way that the, the island networks connect or, or don't connect. Um, with this really wide reaching policy framework uh, that covers so many areas of um, island and rural regeneration. Thank you very much, Adele. Uh, is the um, the cable damage uh, to Orkney, has that had a, an impact on you? 
I'm not sure. Yesterday and today, there's just been some intermittency issues with that, um, but it's been stormy, like you said, so it could be any number of factors, but hopefully it stays stable. Good stuff. Thank you. And uh, next, I can see Anne. Hello, Anne. Anne McDonald. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I'm Anne McDonald. I'm at Scottish Futures Trust, where I'm leading on the design and delivery of the Islands programme for the Scottish Government Islands team. Um, that's part of the National Islands Plan. I live on Tyree. Um, big faux pas there. I live in Tyree, and we can talk about that, that you live in an island, not on a rock. Um, I'm a chartered accountant. Um, I'm also a director of SIF, Scottish Islands Federation, and I my interests are in island communities, development um, and infrastructure. Thank you very much. Excellent. Good to have you. And uh, next we have Anna. That me, there's quite a few Annas here, I think. Oh, okay, yes, right. Well, Anna Whelan, yes, it is yourself. Yes. Yeah, that, that's me. Yeah, sorry, we did have a bit of a glitch just now. Um, I'm Anna Whelan. I'm currently Strategy and Partnerships Manager for Orkney Islands Council. I've actually been here 20, nearly 23 years now. Seems incredible. Um, always doing the same sort of things, but get rebadged every couple of years. So um, I look after community planning, strategy, policy, corporate governance, that kind of thing. And I'm one thing I'm interested in, uh, which is one reason I'm here, is the concept of a single public authority for the islands, bringing together all the, the public bodies. We've been looking at that for quite a number of years. Yeah, thank you. I'm, sh I'm sure we will uh, discuss that because that's a, it's a very interesting and live topic. So thank you. And uh, I can see Bobby there as well. Hello, uh, Bobby McCauley, uh, originally from Unst in Shetland, uh, but currently, unfortunately, residing in Glasgow. Uh, I'm a research associate at the Centre for Mountain Studies at the University of the Highlands and Islands, uh, with a general research focus on land reform, community land ownership and rural and islands development. Thank you, Bobby. Nice to see you. And uh, oh, that's a good thing I'm making a list here because the, the faces are all moving around. It's like a well, it's like a game here. So um, if I miss you out, apologies. We'll we'll pick you up uh, at the end of this uh, little session. Uh, next we have uh, Brendan. Hello, Brendan. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Or is it good middle of the night to some people? I see Laurie there from from PE. I I, I admire your stature, Laurie. <laughs> your stamina. Um, I'm Brendan and I'm based in County Kerry, which is in the southwest of Ireland. And I'm on the mainland, but on an island or in an island. Um, so looking across the bay here at Valencia Island, which um, is the island from which the internet developed. It was the point at which the first transatlantic cable was laid between Europe and North America. So my interest is in endogenous or bottom-up local development because I am involved with a number of community and voluntary groups here locally and I'm also particularly interested in the relationship between bottom-up and top-down and the role of the state and how the state can be an enabler of or a barrier to um, community-led local development and by background I'm a geographer and a social scientist and I've had the privilege of working with Andrew for the last few years in co-supervising a PhD thesis on the island governance and ICT and the interfaces and relationships between those. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Good to see you. And uh, next we have Daniel. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, Daniel from Cumbria, just south of the border. Um, I'm looking at uh, rural immigration patterns, uh, e economic activity, and economic regeneration in rural areas. Thank you. Good to see you. And uh, next, uh, we have Gerard. Hello, Gerard. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is it's, uh, Gerard. I'm based on the other side uh, of the world as well, just like Laurie in the middle of the night uh, almost. Uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is by now the official new name of the islands. Um, I teach and do uh, research at Massey University uh, in international development. I have a specialization in public health and public education in remote, fragile or very rural places. That includes um, islands. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. And beside Gerard on the screen, we have uh, Godfrey. 
Hello, Godfrey. Good morning, everyone, or a good uh, good afternoon, good evening to <laughs> whoever may be in a awkward time zone. My name is Godfrey. My second name is Baldacchino, which is quite a mouthful for some of you. Uh, I'm Maltese, uh, Maltese Canadian, actually, so uh, two two uh, nationalities, two citizenships, uh, straddling uh, opposite ends of the Atlantic. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Malta. I spent time as a Canada Research Chair in Island Studies at the University of Prince Edward Island. I'm also Malta's ambassador at large for islands and small states. Thank you very much, Godfrey. And the, the most quoted um, uh, scholar in my uh, Island Studies uh, student essays. So. <laughs> And uh, next we have uh, James. It could, been a quiz, it could have been a quiz question, Andrew. <laughs> that should have been the one, absolutely. Oh. So uh, next we have James. Hi, James. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Great to see some familiar faces or put some faces to some, some names from, from emails. Um, James Ellsmore, based in Portugal from Island Innovation. And my focus, I guess, would be sustainability, but in its broadest terms, not limited to just climate and environment, but sustainability of society, uh, economy, and, and everything else for islands. Thank you very much, James. Good to see you. Uh, you're in Portugal now, is that right? Yes, indeed. Not on an island, I hate to admit it, but uh, just for full transparency. <laughs> you can always consider Madeira. I'm going next month. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you very much, James. And um, besides James, we have Janelle. Hi, Janelle. Um, um, well, it's good evening from me. Um, I'm true. currently I'm with the University of Tasmania, but I currently live in Melbourne uh, because that's where my grandchildren are located, and I like to now spend some time with them. I have the privilege of having had a PhD student whose PhD was marked by Godfrey. Um, it was on King Island and it was by a woman by the name of Lee Coates. And I still remember the absolutely fabulous, favourable report that came back to Godfrey. Um, my interests are community development with a particular focus on access to higher education on islands. And the last fact about me is that I've worked extensively um, across the archipelago of Indonesia. Thank you very much, Janelle. So what time is it with you? There. Uh, well, it's currently um, nine o'clock, um, but by the time you finish, it will be midnight for me. Um, the story of my life in my connection with UHI. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, next we have John. Hello, John. Hello, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, my name is John Goodlad. I'm a Shetlander. And like many Shetlanders, I work in the seafood business. Uh, for many years, I was a fish farmer, and I now advise an international seafood fund, a seafood investment fund. I just love the way different islands connect. And Brendan, when you told me that you were uh, next to Valencia Island in uh, Ireland, um, I was recalling that that's where we built our first fish farm boat when we set up our company. So I just love the way all these connections come through. Um, I've always been passionate about Shetland's history, culture and economy. I'm a firm believer in island autonomy, having stood on that platform in a general election more years ago than I care to remember. I'm also a writer. My last book, The Salt Roads, looks at how sea and fish has linked Shetland to the rest of Europe over hundreds of years and in some quite remarkable ways. So thanks very much for inviting me to take part in this event and really looking forward to the discussion. Good to see you, John. Great stuff. And uh, beside you, we've got Kieran. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, well, 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 to be I'm very humble to be part of this group. Um, I'm very much a simple islander. I uh, I work for the uh, Development Trust on Sandy. That's in one of the North Isles on Orkney. I'm also a relatively newbie member of uh, Scottish Islands Federation as a director, just joining. So I've been there one one uh, meeting, and also was a uh, island ambassador for the excellent Island Innovation Program last year. So good to see some some familiar 
faces there. Um, that's taught me a lot and and very much uh, as this meeting started with a poll, those meetings used to start with a poll and it's reminded myself how little I know of geography, but um, very much here from the point of view of uh, living on an island and very keen and in, understand the importance of developing islands and, and keeping what we have going forward. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. And beside you, no, the Falcon, no, I think we'll see again. Uh, we've got uh, Laurie. Hi, Laurie. Hi there. Yes, I'm actually dressed uh, before I'm normally <laughs> dressed. It's very early here. Um, I am here in Prince Edward Island, Canada, on the East Coast, fairly close to uh, Shetland. Just a little hop, skip and jump. Um, I am the coordinator of the Master of Arts and Island Studies program, as well as the chair of the executive committee of the Institute of Island Studies, which has been going for nearly, well, probably 41 years now. I think it started in 1982 here at UPEI, and we, uh, I first met Godfrey in 1992 when he came to a conference uh, at UPEI and have many, many wonderful connections with so many of you, including Daniel from just yesterday, I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before. And um, so it's fantastic to have this island studies uh, connection all around the world. Um, my particular interest is in island attachment to islands. What are the commonalities that uh, we face? Um, what, what's the island effect or what we call islandness? We're also interested here with the Institute on population retention and population um, well-being and um, land issues, um, of course, climate change, all of those things. And I'm a poet and try to capture some of these things in, in my writing when, when I'm not writing academic papers. So I need more time for poetry in my life, so working towards it. Thanks for having us here, Andrew. What a wonderful- uh, Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. So um, what time in the morning is it then with you? It is just six o'clock. Normally I'm still asleep. <laughs> Great stuff. Good to have you. Um, right next, we have Malcolm. Hello, Malcolm. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Malcolm Minnis. I'm director of the Centre for Island Creativity at UHI. I'm based in Shetland. Um, I'm also, so I live in Shetland, but I live on an island um, off the mainland of Shetland. So I'm on Bressy, uh, 340 population. Uh, I'm a new Shetlander, as you might recognise from the uh, the accent. Um, as as part of living on Bressy, I seem to have fallen into being a voluntary director of Bressy Development um, Limited as well, looking after our, our local community hub. Um, I'm also a trustee of Shetland Arts Development Agency. Um, my own interest area um, for research is art, design, um, and particularly in tangible cultural heritage, um, mostly related to islands. Thank you, Malcolm. It's good to see you. So, Malcolm and I uh, work together, but we very rarely see each other because we're coming in from our own uh, computers and from different parts of Shetland. So. And next we have Marcus. Hello, Marcus. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here uh, this morning. It's a, it's a fairly normal um, time zone here for getting up. It's 10 o'clock in Aberdeen. Um, I'm originally from Orkney and I'm a PhD student at the James Hutton Institute and the University of Aberdeen, funded by the Scottish Graduate School for Social Science. I'm a first year student, and so my, my project is still very much being um, formed, but my interest lies in what is balanced, sustainable populations. What does that mean for communities? Um, what does it mean for the different levels of, of governance in communities? Um, how is that influenced by the term perma crisis? And how can balanced populations be achieved during um, or while experiencing a perma crisis? Thank you very much, Marcus. Good to see you. Good to have you all the way from Aberdeen. And uh, next we have uh, Matthew. Hello, I'm Matthew, uh, another Shetlander, although I'm in Edinburgh at the moment, uh, and I'm a final year PhD student looking at the modern uh, political and constitutional history of Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. So looking at things like local government reform in the 60s and the 70s, engagements with devolution in the 70s and sort of the first years in the creation of the Islands Councils. So a fair amount of sort of core periphery relationships um, at, at play in some of those themes. Absolutely. So look forward to hear again what you have to say um, this morning. Good to see you. And uh, next we have Nicola. Hello, Nicola. 
Hi Andrew, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Nicola Crook, I'm based in Loch Lomond and I lead uh, the Scottish Government Islands team on secondment from the Scottish Islands Federation. And our main policy area is to implement the Islands Scotland Act and deliver uh, the National Islands Plan as dictated by that. Um, and my background is in law uh, before I moved into Islands Law and Policy. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's good to have you here. Nice to see you. And beside you, we have Ruth. Hello, Ruth. No, your microphone's not working. You're still on mute. It's been a bit flaky. That's, Is it working now? Yeah. It's working now. Yep. So, hi, everybody. Um, I need to get a new headset. Um, I'm a social scientist at the James Sutton Institute, um, which is based in Aberdeen. Um, I'm a sociologist by background, and my research interests are broadly around um, rural and island communities and what makes them thrive. So, uh, yes, jobs, housing, uh, services, but also less tangible aspects um, like, you know, uh, social relationships, sense of belonging, cultural aspects. Um, we led the first National Islands Plan survey in 2020. Um, we've got two PhD students who are here today, Nicola, uh, Nicola um, Kirsten and Marcus, um, who are focusing broadly on island migration. Um, and we've got a new five-year programme of research on rural and island communities and economies for the Scottish Government, which is um, really exciting because it gives us a chance to do some in-depth longitudinal work with communities across Scotland, including several islands. Um, also, a personal interest in islands, um, having lived in the Outer Hebrides and with family connections in Skye and Easdale. So, lots of island interest and, um, yeah, really pleased to be here and a great time for us to be having this workshop. So, thank you. Uh, and thank you. It's uh, great to have you, Ruth. And uh, next we have Sandy. Hey, good morning. Um, so, I'm from Mull and I live on the Isle of Mull. Although I'm in Helensburgh just now because we're going to Celtic Connections tomorrow, which is very exciting. Uh, I've got lots of different hats. I'm not an academic uh, at all. So I am chair of our local development trust on Mull, which employs about 25 folk and has been on the go for 25 years. I was chair for quite a long time of Development Trust Association Scotland and very involved with development of uh, trusts and other local organisations all the way around about the islands and uh, the rest of Scotland as well. I'm involved with the Scottish Islands Federation and I was uh, helping with the participatory processes to do with the islands plan consultation. Lots of different hats. Good to see you, Sandy. Good to have you here. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoy Celtic Connections um, the weekend. So, um, and then beside you, we have Stacey. Hello, Stacey. Hello, everybody. It's great to see some of the faces to the names I've been corresponding with. I'm James's colleague at Island Innovation. I am currently the community manager as well as the um, ambassador program coordinator. So it's great to see Kieran here. I also organize the academic council. And I'm based in Barbados, where it is a chilly 23 degrees Celsius at the moment because it's early in the morning so <laughs> so we're um so it's a bit cold here um and my interest chiefly has to do with sustainability climate change and human rights my background is in law and education so one of my chief interests is to see how i can integrate climate change education into curricula as well as some of the impacts of climate change on indigenous people in the caribbean region there's you know there's quite a lack of, of research and data in that area and I'm really, really, really excited to be here. I sent a message to James saying I'm trying to look very calm, but I'm so excited to be here. And it's really great to, to see everyone and be here. So I look forward to a fantastic session. Thank you very much, Stacey. And we're excited to have you here, even if the temperature is 23 with you, which seems totally unfair. But there we go. <laughs> uh, and uh, then I think uh, we also have, yes, we have Tommy. Hello, Tommy. Hi all. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Tommy Coots. I'm uh, the manager of the Economic Development Service for Shetland Islands Council. Um, so we deal uh, a great deal with community regeneration, uh, business support, and 
uh, making doing our best to make Shetland uh, an attractive place to live, work, and study. Um, I uh, work in Lerwick, but uh, I'm from. I, I live on the island of Yell, um, which has its own issues with transport connectivity and, and other forms of connectivity. And I'm originally from uh, the island of Fetler, which is much smaller and has long-standing issues with population decline, uh, service decline, and and others. Um, so, yeah, I've just uh, very interested to hear uh, what's going on during the day. But uh, my apologies, as I'll, I'll have to drop in and out of the, the day as I, I'm actually um, entertaining Scottish government officials who are up here to uh, discuss island island issues and uh, the issues of island life. So. That's that's absolutely fine, uh, Tommy. That's that's great. It's great to, to actually see. You. I wasn't sure if you were able to uh, join us or not at all. So that's grand. And if you want to bring the Scottish government uh, in to the uh, the workshop, um, you know, please do. <laughs> So, um, I don't think there's anybody else. I, if I have missed anybody, um, I apologise, but I think I've got everybody there. Okay. So, wow, what a group of experts and islanders and island experts. And, you know, we have um, extremely um, high quality expertise, which we're going to put to a good use um, this morning. Um, I'm going to open up uh, a couple of um slidos now that you can just think about and start filling in while i tell you a little bit more about uh, the workshops and why i thought it was a good idea to have them in the first place so uh let's see where we are where are we now um right the, the first one i would just want you to think about um is imagine you're visiting a scottish island in 2050 and what's the first thing that catches your eye okay so um have a little think about that. And then um, also, let's see, back to list. Um, the other one is, uh, what do you think will be the main challenges facing the Scottish um, islands in 2050? Okay, so we'll open that one as well. And you can have a, a swither about those while I tell you a little bit more about this uh, workshop project. And I'll try and get it all finished um, in good time for the arrival, I hope, of Jürgen from the Orland Islands. Okay, so there are going to be four of these uh, workshops. This is the first of a... Um, and the Chuka, sorry to interrupt, but can I ask yes. really quickly? I... Yes. I can't see, like I was in the middle of answering one of the polls and it flipped to the second poll and I can't get back to the, okay. I don't know if other people are having this issue. Yes. Yeah, we just go back one. There should be a, there should be a wee um, arrow. No, there's not, Andrew. There's not. Okay, so will I close the, the second one then? Close the second one and go back to the first one. Okay. And we'll open... And then I can reopen it again, I take it. Deactivate it. Okay, so I'll reactivate it shortly. Okay, thanks. This is, a, a, I can't claim to be a Slido expert. This is the first time I've used it. Um, so uh, there will likely be glitches. So there we go. Where are we then? Okay, well, that's great. If there's anything, just speak up and then we can... Stop Andrew, it. I think you need to reactivate the, the first poll there. Okay. It's not showing up in Slido. Right, so, uh, launch. How's that then? Ah! Perfect. <laughs> so it is one at a time. Okay, that's that's good to know. Right, okay. So once that's been populated with some outlandish answers, um, We'll move on to the, the next one. Uh, so, uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming to, to this workshop. Uh, but there are some others coming up as well, which might whet your interest. And if you want to take part in the other ones coming up, then please do. So, um, as well as looking at the sort of political side of things today and the relationships between core and periphery, or the peripheralization of our islands, um, the the one that's coming up in March will be focusing on the role of, of language, cultural culture and heritage in our future. What, what sort of role will they have in supporting vibrant communities 
um, in 2050 and beyond. Will we still have a role or uh, are the things that we can do to um, increase their impact on the, um, the, the communities? And what will the future of Gaelic be? Will there still be any Gaelic speakers left in the Outer Hebrides uh, beyond 2050? And then there's uh, some interesting discussions going on at the moment about uh, the um, use of Shetland and the Orcadian dialects in, in the Northern Isles communities as well. So that will be for those with a particular interest in the cultural and the perhaps the um, creativity side of the uh, future. Um, the third one will be more or less, a, a, I suppose, a sort of development of this uh, workshop. Um, it says it'll be held in Orkney. That just means that I'll be a, in Orkney. And if anyone is physically in Orkney, uh, you know, we'll be able to organise a, a hybrid event, uh, which we'll also, we could also do on the second one as well, which will see me uh, and some colleagues in, in Lewis. This was supposed to be a hybrid event, but actually it turned out that virtually everybody was um, able to come in uh, via BC, so we felt we'd just um, make it entirely online. And then the, the fourth and last of the workshops will be bringing everything together. Um, and yeah, all, looking at all the recommendations from the previous workshops and any other ideas that people may want to, to discuss. So um, please have a think about some of these as well. And if you want to take part in them, you'd be more than welcome. And also, if you have any suggestions about uh, likely um, participants that you think would enhance these experiences, then let me know as well. Now, it's the Royal Society of Edinburgh workshop. The Royal Society of Edinburgh has funded a number of, of research uh, workshops and networks with a, a goal of bringing together people um, with expertise and also um, with an eye to developing further research projects. So it would be excellent if on the back of these workshops, we could actually um, come up with a research project, a detailed research project looking at the Scottish islands. Um, from 2050 onwards. So there we go, little quote. We'll just tell you a little bit about um, futuristics or futurism, uh, depending on your um, which of the terms uh, you prefer. People have been um, looking at the future, uh, you know, for as long as there have been uh, human beings. Um, but from the 19th century onwards, a number of scholars and writers. Um, you know, created the the, um, the genre of, of science fiction and started looking ahead, Jules Verne, etc. But um, I'd like us to bear this in mind uh, today and on the other workshops, and and let's let's start, let's start thinking out the box. You know, let's let's think where we could be in twenty fifty. Where would we like to be in twenty fifty? The Discipline of futuristics has an island-based um, origin, which um, this is. You look over the horizon to see what uh, could be coming down the um, down the track, as it were. Now, okay, we'll come to that in just in a minute. Um, not all views of the future have come to pass, uh, but that doesn't matter. What we want to do today is imagine futures, look at the trends, imagine where we could be and um, come up with some some ideas that uh, might seem a little bit wacky. So, you know, um, the idea of flight, personal flight, well, there, there we go. It's it seemed very strange in uh, 1890, but we have we have planes, we travel around the world. And sometimes the way that the, the future has been imagined in the past has um, proven to be more accurate than people can possibly imagine. So this is an image from the 1930s. There we have, um, you know, mobile phones. Who would have thought that these could actually come uh, to fruition? Um, a very inspirational figure. Um, in the field of futuristics, that is to say, 
looking beyond the horizon, not just following <laughs> um, expected trends, was Professor Jim Dater from University of Hawaii. So, as I say, there is um, one of the, uh, the real originators of futuristics as a discipline comes from an island. He's a sociologist in the, in the University of Hawaii. And he came up with three laws of the future, which uh, I think we should try and bear in mind when we're thinking today. So, there we go. The future cannot be predicted because the future doesn't exist. But alternative futures can and should be forecast. And that's what I'm hoping we're going to do. Um, preferred futures can and should be envisaged, invented, implemented, continuously evaluated, revised, and re envisioned. To be useful, future studies, or futuristics, a term we also coined, needs to proceed and then be linked to strategic planning and thanks to administration. So, what we're doing today, we're imagining beyond. The, um, the existing um, planning structure that exists. And I think my favourite uh, of his uh, laws of the future is any useful idea about the future sh should appear to be ridiculous. Okay. So um, when somebody put vineyard as the first thing you see in the Scottish uh, islands by 2050, uh, that might not be so ridiculous uh, after all. And then his third one, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. So if you come up with a, 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 a some interesting uh, future plan, that might be the tool that actually brings it into existence. Okay. That's him, by the way, if you're wondering about the interesting images. Now, he also came up with the idea of four different generic futures that uh, people who are looking into the future often come up with. So there's the um, the idea just of growth. Okay, so the uh, the future is just a manifestation of current trends and uh, conditions extrapolated forward. You know, so um, twenty fifty is not going to be that different from uh, where we are today. So it's just going to be a, you know, see where you're going, and that's that's where you're going to going to go. And continued economic growth is the base for this sort of official uh, view of the future. Um, discipline, well, we're we can sort of pass over that. I'm not particularly interested in that uh, in generic future uh, today, but that's one where um, to ensure that growth can continue, you bring in um, sort of. Uh, Perhaps the authoritarian regime to sort of force people to behave in a certain way. Um, collapse, though, that could be a, a future that is awaiting us um, for various reasons. The the climate being one of them, um, and this is also seen as what might happen if continuous growth starts to level off, and then we end up um, in in a collapse. So, are we going to have? Um, uh, a future for the Scottish Islands that is actually uh, worse than the the current state, as it were. I hope not. So what I want us to do today is think about transformation. So this is a fundamental reorganisation of a system that uh, breaks with uh, previous um, the, the previous system and leads to a new uh, and transformational uh, future. These um, four elements have been used in a whole range of uh, scholarly explorations of the future, looking at different aspects eh, of society. Um, and we don't have one for the Scottish Islands eh, yet, but we could we could put that in eh, at the bottom. So will we be experiencing just growth as the eh, current plans um, anticipate? Will we have collapsed? Will the Scottish Islands be um, heading for serious depopulation or submersion or whatever it might be by 2050 and beyond? Or will we have uh, transformational ideas that will ensure successful um, yeah, communities and a successful future? 
So come to them. Um, looking at the future, um, if you just Google it, uh, you'll find there's a whole range of uh, workshops and um, conferences out there where um, people are looking into the, uh, the, the mid-century and beyond. Um, so this is one that I, uh, I was reading up about, which was particularly uh, interesting and um, relevant. So looking at the Arctic futures in 2050. And it, it also gathered together scientists, um, people who live in the Arctic and policymakers to try and um, work out transformation change for the Arctic. So we're part of a part of a trend, if you like, that's going on at the moment. And Shetland actually has a tradition um, of, of doing this, looking into the future to imagine what um, Shetland might be like. And I think that uh, what the Shetland Community Planning Partnership did in 20, 2011 um, may have referenced um, Jim Data, in fact, because they came up with four possible futures for Shetland um, that seemed to map onto his four generic uh, futures. So, in our rights, Lester, that's sort of just keeping going. Um, as 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 we as we are keeping on knapping, um, poor local decision making, but good economic balance. Just the way with strong local decision making, but a lack of economic balance, and got in a grip. Strong local decision making and a good economic balance, and um, that's what I hope that we're going to um, do today. We're going to imagine that the islands have gotten a grip by twenty fifty. So in our exploration uh, this morning, um, we will look at poor futures, sort of conventional futures and high aspiration uh, futures. This is a, a, a visualization from the Institute for Alternative Futures, which um, you know, is, is, you know, is doing that. It's also based on um, the generic um, the four generic ideas of the future. So, although there are only three of them there, there's a zone of growing desperation. That's a really bad one. Two versions of the zone of conventional expectation, where you've got a little bit of failure or a little bit of success, or a zone of high aspiration, where we want to focus our uh, our thinking today, because that is what we want to aim for. We don't want to have just conventional uh, expectations or really bad outcomes. We want to think of high aspiration of where the Scottish islands could be. Um, nearly finished this little uh, this little bit. Um, I just want someone to, to mention that um, I used to teach a module looking at Scottish island futures, well, island futures in general, with um, a focus on, on Scotland. And it was part of the Emlet in Island Studies. And I want to revive this module as part of the, the MLIT in future. And I'm hoping that um, events like this will help us help to feed into that and that uh, we'll be able to call upon the expertise of people that we're making these, these connections uh, in future. And I would really like the Island Futures model module to be CPD offered across the Scottish Islands um, for people working in island um, governance and, and in island communities. And if we can make it really relevant based on these discussions, uh, I think we could have a valuable resource for the future to ensure that we, we go into this zone of high expectation in the islands. Okay, today's plan, well, I don't need to belabor that because you've got your uh, you've got your agenda uh, there. But I want us to aim high. Okay, so um, I was exploring what's already been done, apart from the, you know, the Shetland one, which was sort of looking far into the future. Um, we have a, a kind of planning horizon at the moment. So there are a number of excellent plans out there 
but they don't look huge, you know, very far into the future. They're they're um, within the the twenty twenties or um, as far as twenty forty. But we're actually looking beyond that. So, um, you know, we're we're literally over the the planning horizon. And this was an idea that was put forward by Wendy Schultz. So, um, she suggested that you know you put. The timeline here, so administration looks a little bit into the future. Planning is, is uh, also looks a little bit further into the future, but future research and what we are doing today looks much further into a, the future. Okay. And I want just to think about, um, for example, the these uh, partnership plans. If you know about these or if you're involved in these, uh, I'd like to know, um, get some feedback from you. Um, about those, so, but they are created within existing governance structures. Uh, as I said, our plans must work within the legal and political frameworks determined by the UK and Scottish governments. So they have a short time scale, but we want to sort of push the boundaries a bit. And just a, an image, what will the islands in 2050 be like? Which of these, I'll say, I'm not going to have all four, I just want three of these uh, potential uh, outcomes. Will it be um, just the, the development of existing trends, a sort of uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper's idea of growth? This is what they think uh, the world will be like in 2050. Okay, China at the top, or will we be in a, a collapsing uh, situation? Peter Zahan is um, um, an, a fascinating person who um, looks at trends based on geopolitical. Uh, situations and he thinks that, for example, um, China will have collapsed by um, 2050. So it's definitely not going to be at the top of this list. So are we going to have a, a Scottish island scenario like that? Or will we be faced by a transformational change um, that we will have to um, engage with? So Ray Kurzweil came up with the idea of singularity. Uh, in the early 2000s, and he estimated that uh, there'll be a huge technological change by 2045. That will be the singularity. So, what will the islands be like after that? So, just sort of things to uh, to think about. What will the the world situation be like for the Scottish islands? Because we, you know, we tend to think. So inwardly, it's going to be like this, it's going to be like that. But what, what will the bigger picture be like in which we're, we're living in 2050? So what sort of governance structures do we want to encourage transformational change, but also to face up to these big changes that are coming down the line? Um, but just, uh, so just for your edification, if we think back to 1996, which is the same um, number of years back from now, that's 2050, is uh, this might help shape our thinking as well. Um, 1996 was the International Year of the Eradication of Poverty. Well, I don't know if that went uh, particularly well. And um, it was a year where some of the trends that uh, are part of our lives today were just starting off. So, um, we have uh, DNA, well, we have Dolly the sheep, so that's a, a, an interesting example. She was born. Um, we have the first mobile the flip phone that was going on, state on sale. Um, there was social change in Ireland, citizens of the Republic of Ireland allowed to divorce, and uh, the beginning of AI and its interesting threats uh, was uh, just on a becoming apparent as well when Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov. So this might help shape your wilder imaginings for 2050, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so there will be big changes, but there will be continuities as well. And just um, a sort of Shetland relevant one, 1996 was when the Shetland Times and Shetland News um, went, uh, were at loggerheads for copyright infringement when um, the Shetland News was taking stories from Shetland Times and putting them uh, online. So um, some of the 
the world in which we live today was starting to appear in 1996. So what's 2050 going to be like? What are the themes and threads that started to appear today that will exist then? Okay, so um, there we go. Okay, some things to think about um, when we get started on our discussions. Thank you very much for the what you see in 2050. I'll have a look at those um, in a minute. So lack of young people, lots of people, great local facilities, diversity, uh, natural beauty, it's landscape, spectacular uh, landscape, power generation, local, futuristic transportation, there we go, um, empty houses. So it's a very wide range of um, expectations for 2050. And we want to avoid the empty houses, lack of young people, um, and aim for local power generation, futuristic transport, lots of people so you get that particular uh, future. Okay, so I will close that one just now, deactivate that poll, and I'll start the other one uh, shortly. But in the meantime, before I do that, I would like to welcome Jürgen Peterson from the Orland Islands. It's great to see you, Jürgen. Jürgen is going to tell us about Orland autonomy, and this might well be um, a, a prototype for uh, the Scottish Islands gaining transformation change in 2050. So hello, Jürgen. Hi there. I'll uh, try to see if there is any chance I could share the screen. Did this work? Yes, there we go. Do you only see, you see a lot of things there, don't you know? See, you see, we see your whole screen. Yeah, let's see if I'll take only this one. Do, 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 do. Window, this one. Perfect. Like that, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I'll have 15 minutes of fame as I understood it. And I look forward to that very much. Shetland is a place very close to my heart as is Orkney and Western Isles and not to mention the rest of Scotland who is attached to your islands uh, from what I understand. It's great to see you all and the discussion that you have is very important. I represent Åland. 6,757 islands, depending a little bit how you count them, of which roughly 60 are inhabited. That's our place up in the Baltic Sea. We are self-governed, we're autonomous, we're demilitarized, and we're neutralized, as per uh, the Crimean War, to be exact, a long time ago, 1850-something. Today we celebrated, last year we celebrated 100 year of autonomy. In 100 year we have been in the fortunate situation that we can handle quite a few of our internal uh, domestic affairs by ourselves without involving Finland, who is, other, uh, is our uh, parent, I guess is the right phrase for it. We are 30,000 now, the graph is old. We're 30,000 people, roughly half of them living on the countryside, one third living in Mariahamn, our capital, and the rest is in our archipelago, which is a, a quite a unique uh, uh, arrangement where they're all depending on each other in different ways. One could say that we have the, the same conflicts as you have, in between cities and countryside. It's a little bit like that, but even, even so not, because we are only 30,000 and therefore every most of us understand that there are really no room for, for conflicts here. In 1809, we were conquered by Russia. In 1854, we were, uh, uh, the, the Russians built a huge fortress, which was, uh, we were deliberated by the uh, British and the French who came up through the Baltic Sea and made sure that the Russians went home never to come back. We were declared a demilitarized zone because of our uh, tactical uh, strategic position within the Baltic Sea. 
Uh, we even have a memory from that in the Triumph Bow in Paris. After 1921, we gained our own self-government, meaning that Finland has to guarantee the population of all and the preservation of their Swedish language, their culture and our local customs. This was a result after a conflict between Sweden and Finland, where the Orlanders wanted to belong to Sweden and Sweden very seriously wanted to own the Åland Islands. But hence the strategic uh, where we strategically are in the Baltic and hence the uh, superpowers at that time. The decision was made, the only decision more or less from the League of Nations saying that Åland should belong to Finland. We were guaranteed all these uh, demilitarization and neutralization by Great Britain, France, Sweden, Denmark, Russia, Germany, Iceland, Estonia, Finland, Ireland, Latvia and Poland. Meaning that today, when we are on the brink to move into NATO, uh, nobody has questioned this neutralization and demilitarization because it is an outcome of an international agreement. And once you've had an international agreement, they are very, very difficult to change in either way. It's a standstill principle which has been confirmed again during this NATO process. In modern history, uh, we, fin Finland gained their independence in 1917, which made everyone on Åland to think what would be best. Should we go to, fit to Sweden, the country we know since centuries, or the pretty newly formed nation of Finland? That was the basis of the worries. I think it's fair to say that the Ålanders felt at that time. Anyway, we got the decision from the League of Nations, we got our autonomy. Our first act on autonomy took effect in 1922. We are now negotiating on our fourth act of autonomy over all these 100 years. We got our own flag in 1954, which was symbolically very, very important. And ever since 1970, we are a part of the Nordic Council. Uh, in 84, we got stamps. For those of you who are older, you remember stamps are small things that you put on envelopes to make sure that it arrived to the right addressee somewhere in the world. Nowadays, you just click on a button. Uh, but those were the days and the stamps has been very fortunate for Åland, both financially and identically, which is interesting. Symbols makes difference. Uh, in 1995, we became a member of the EU and since that very many things changed again. Uh, we don't negotiate only with Helsinki, which is our capital, but also with uh, Brussels, who then, uh, uh, well, you, you know all about that in, in, in the EU. We got our own post in 1993 and we got our own radio and TV service, our public service, our BBC, ever since 1996. The Åland Parliament is 30 members. I am one of them. I'm also the chair of the Finance and Business Committee. We're elected every four years. Uh, we have election this autumn. To be able to take part in this election, you have to uh, an, an franchise and an eligibility dependent on right of domicile, which is uh, I will explain at the very end of this. We're organized in uh, the Åland Parliament is as much very, very similar to the Scottish Parliament in many ways. Uh, we then have a, a, an Åland government which is appointed by the Parliament after the election. And there is the administration and the political leadership and uh, roughly six different departments for different uh, uh, administrations. The self our legislative power is in areas such as education, culture and heritage sites, health care, hospitals, social care, which is the clearly most expensive, so to say. That takes roughly half of our budget every year. Environmental issues, trade and industry, local transport, municipal 
municipal administration and taxation. We are still uh, divided into 16 different municipalities. We, we used to say that we are probably having the world record in, uh, in local uh, decisiveness, is that the word, in local administration. We are best in the world when it comes to, to the, make decisions locally. Policing is, uh, uh, is our uh, legislator, as is postal service and radio and TV, which I said. For Finland, this means that we can take care of most of our uh, daily life uh, challenges, but not when it comes to foreign affairs and not when it comes to taxation not when it comes to most civil and criminal law matters, the court system, customs, coast guard, civil protection and the church act. All of these is subject for negotiations constantly when it comes to uh, to reforming our uh, autonomy act. It's not very easy though. We want it one way, but Finland generally wants it another way. In dialogues with Finland, we uh, have the governor of Åland, who is appointed in consultation with the Åland parliament, and really, in fact, by recommendation with the Åland parliament. It wouldn't happen that Finland would appoint a governor that is not sanctioned by the Åland parliament. We are right now uh, actually in the process of having a new governor after the present one, him on the picture there, is retiring after 20 odd years. We also have the Åland delegation uh, that, is, uh, that presents a statement of opinion and competence when it comes to legislation, which has to be confirmed by the president of Finland in order to be real also for Åland. We have one member of parliament in Finland out of 200. Shipping is our grand industry started off with a small scale farmer shipping many many years ago uh, and today we have a modern commercial fleet we take care of literally every all the ferries between finland and sweden uh, our economy in figures is that the private sector still is the largest one but that's that the the signs are that it's weakening and the, that the public sector will increase instead of the other way around. Uh, the benefits of our autonomy, it is to strengthen identity in a diverse world, which you clearly can see from stamps, from flags, from what have you. It's tool to raise on our profile. The autonomy forces countries to acknowledge your existence. When we turned 100 years the other year, last year, we had ambassadors in Finland present here in Åland from like 50 different countries. And all of these countries have now written reports back home to the governments and parliament saying that Åland is a subject, it's not an object. And that is something that is probably the most important thing you can do as an autonomy to make sure that you are heard, that you are listened to and that you are seen. Because if we would settle with just being a subject for everyone else to, to treat, that wouldn't be the right way to strengthen our autonomy. So basically we want to be an object, not a subject. Uh, our storytelling is one of the most important things in order to attract all this interest from the outer world and it inspire us to try harder in competition with the outside in sports in culture in businesses and what have you uh, the latest one is now that we are preparing for a large scale uh, sea-based wind park very similar to the projects that's going on also in, in Shetland, Orkney and Western Isles. We do the same. We're islanders. We want to take advantage of the wind. Uh, we do have an international self-confidence, we hope. We are used to deal with our own matters. And we're also free to deal with our own priori priorities. 
which are different to those in larger countries. In the Nordic countries, which we have the towards which we have the closest cooperation, we have the representation both in the Nordic Council and in the Nordic Council of Ministers. And we, Olandic and the Nordic benefits on an equal footing. They see how we deal with things and we learn from them. Just before this meeting, we had a, a, a meeting together with chairs from the different infrastructural committees all around the Nordic countries, sharing experience when it comes to exploring hydrogen as the future fuel, when it comes to how to deal with the, with the infrastructural uh, challenges, tunnels, roads, ferries, and so on and so on, electrifying cars and what have you. We also have a Nordic Institute in Åland. We are a member, as I said, since 1995 in the EU. We were introduced by the Euro since 1st January 2002. That's very boring compared with how it used to be, but also very much more pre... pre, uh, pre you, you can see what will come in the future in another way. So you sleep probably better, but it's not as fun as to have a, an exchange rate which you have to consider every day in your daily life. <clears throat> All on status in international law has been emphasized during this membership in the EU, and it was strengthened again now when it comes to Finland and also Sweden uh, seeking uh, membership in NATO. We approve all international treaties that Finland goes into. We're outside the fiscal union, which makes things a little bit complicated, but has also made it possible for all the shipping, all the ferries between Finland and Sweden and Estonia, while they are passing Åland and mooring at the Åland Islands and contributing to the infrastructure, they are allowed to continue to sell tax-free on board which in a way is a sort of subsidized from the EU because it considered needed when we entered the EU that if we couldn't continue with the tax free, the transport and, and the traffic to and from the island would, would be very, very, would suffer very hardly. So that's something we still are. We are outside the fiscal union. That is challenging today because many people, they think that it's complicated to order stuff from abroad to Åland. And the other way around, it's complicated for exporters here in Åland to sell things abroad. On the other hand, it has made us having like 24 departures every day from an island consisting of 30,000 people which is unique. It's literally like living on the mainland, although we live on an island. Uh, there are derogations relating to all on special status in international law and also laid down in three articles in a special protocol in the EU, meaning that this exemption and us being outside the fiscal union, that's something that is there to stay. It's again the standstill principle unless we want to raise it it won't happen and therefore it's a, a quite solid uh, solid structure uh, the Holland economy in figures is that mariham the capital is the largest one the countryside is less and the archipelago is very small what we consider our autonomy being benefits for finland it's not only been beneficial for ourselves but Finland has a great international example for peace solutions, which is used every, by, every now and then when you have conflicts all over. It strengthens the brand of Finland. <clears throat> Åland was actually used when Finland applied for membership of the Security Council of United Nations, claiming that we know what we're doing. We've done this before. We know how to create peaceful solutions. There are no subsidies from Finland to Åland which is also very unique when it comes to small island communities. No subsidies. We have a cultural and linguistic diversity. We bring in Finnish, uh, Swedish in uh, uh, Finnish Finland. And we are pretty good football players, I have to say. 
both our men's and women teams has won the league and even played the Champions League. That's not pretty bad for an island of 30,000. You understand that. You're Scottish, aren't you? Uh, the right of domicile, that's something that is very unique for uh, Åland. Uh, the purpose is to preserve the Åland Swedish language and culture and to ensure the local production resources remain in the hands of the resident population. That does not say that nobody can move in, but they cannot buy property on other areas than those who are planned areas. But would they come to stay here, they are free to buy property on everywhere else. Right of domicile is not a citizenship and it's not intended to limit competition or immigration. The exemptions exist. The right of domicile gives all are given to all those born in Holland if either parent has the right of domicile. Immigrants can apply after five years, lost upon immigration, and it's only for Finnish citizens, knowledge of Swedish is required. We have tried very seriously to change this when we enter the EU, but so far we haven't succeeded. It's still a demand that you have to be a Finnish citizen in order to get the right of domicile in Åland. If you get that, if you have it, you have the right to vote and stand for election in uh, elections for the parliament. You can own real estate. You can do that without the domicile as well. That's very important to know. All the planned area is open for anyone to own it. And you have the right of trade. This was a very brief history of the Åland Islands, but thanks you for listening and congratulations to all of you who are still awake after that. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here and tell, tell you all about this, what, what I care for. Thank you very much indeed, Jürgen. Um... We've already got some responses to what you've been saying, and uh, John Goodlett here in Shetland says, "Brilliant! What an inspiration!" So, it's uh, you, your your talk on uh, life in in the Orland Islands and how you organise things is very inspirational to to the Scottish Islands. Uh, if you just uh, stop sharing your your screen for a second, oh. uh, we'll be able to you'll be able to see um, the faces of the people who were. Uh, enjoying your talk there, and um, it will be now. Uh, it, it, hopefully, you have time for people to ask you uh, some questions uh, about how things are done in the Orland Islands, and for um, yeah, for, you know, some advice on what we should do next. And I can see that uh, John's got his hand up. Uh. Yes, uh, uh, thanks very much for that. That was, as I said, really inspirational. I have a couple of points to make and then one question. Uh, my points are that the Island Islands, like the Faroe Islands, is a true example of where you see the confidence that comes from a degree of autonomy, the ability to make your own decisions. And uh, it, instead of going to Helsinki, in the case of Holland or to Copenhagen in the case of the Faroe Islands, instead of going to these capitals for decisions, you make these decisions yourselves. As, uh, as a very good friend of mine in the Faroe Islands once told me, he said, in the Faroes we are raised to make our own decisions and make be responsible for our own mistakes. What a confidence that is. And my point that I'm trying to make for those of you who are online, who work for the Scottish Government, um, what an inspiration Hollands and the Faroes are. The Scottish Islands should be doing much of the same. We shouldn't be continuing to write and phone and go to Edinburgh looking for this and looking for, that, looking for decisions. We should be empowered to make many more of our own decisions. My question is uh, in terms, you said there are no subsidies uh, from Finland to Holland. Uh, in terms of your uh, budget, do you raise your own taxes or do you get a grant from the Finnish government which represents the amount of tax that you gather? Uh, thank you. We pay exactly the same tax as everyone else in Finland, uh, both companies and privates. Uh, we have, we are, we're, we're very far from being a tax haven. Uh, and that is something that would probably not be politically wise to do up in the Nordic countries, where we have the, the system of Nordic welfare 
and the system of everyone paying equally much of their income in taxes roughly so the answer is that we're paying all our taxes directly to the ministry of finance in finland and we get back a lump sum every year which is 0.47 percent of the total income of finland and that is then adjusted should our population rise that would then be adjusted to increase even more this is a pretty new system we've had it for two years now before that we had since uh, ever since 1995 and onwards up till last year we had nil 0.45 percent that sounds very very tiny but it is a huge difference for a small island so our economy has in fairness struggling struggling been struggling for quite a few decades because that the finance has not been enough we have paid more to finland than we get back that is in fairness it's easy to say but it's not that easy to to prove because there are vats there is uh, uh, border controls there are customs there are this that and the next and depending on how much you weigh into all this equation it's difficult to say but in my view we have always paid more than we have got back from them but that is how it works today and i am very very happy to see that Lori brinklow for example has been here for the island games wow in 1991 which sport sorry i'm just curious i was with the cultural delegation i did not do sport <laughs> good 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 excellent and we have a let's see i think uh, it was adele first and then kirsten and then stacy hello jorgen i think it's just great again to hear about the you know, all the different influences that keep the health of the island alive. We're often trying to pick out one stream or one factory, you know, that can kick off things. But I just wondered, you've mentioned on some of them there, but where were the kind of trickier points of contention, um, you know, in the kind of maintenance of sustainability in your islands? Has there been particular challenges that have been difficult to overcome? Um, yeah, that's my question. <clears throat> it has, it has. We are one of the bad boys when it comes to exhaustion and when it comes to carbon and footprint and everything else depending because we are the hub of the ferry traffic between finland and sweden so they blame us for everything i usually say uh, but we're also having a, a fleet of small ferries going to and from the more remote islands in our archipelago and they are all fueled by fossil fuels which is not sustainable anymore we have been uh, we have been looking into doing as they have done in the faroe islands constructing tunnels and uh, infrastructure as roads instead of ferries which would be a huge benefit for the environment so far we have we have we haven't come to a conclusion it was pretty close to the last year's budget but it fell because of uh, political disagreements and that is one of the things that is raised here on a in a question i see if our remote island communities st are still thriving they're not they're not because when you don't have reliable infrastructure every island communities will struggle and that is what has happened in our remote communities the the population is decreasing and fewer people will want to live there have said that they are also one of the most <clears throat> unique places we have here as our what do they say unique selling points usps we in in Finland and Sweden they have towns like Mariehamn they have countryside like the rest of it but they don't have the archipelago which is really and truly unique so therefore it's one of the challenges for Åland to consider how 
we could make this more sustainable in the future. It's not easy because it's it takes a lot of investments in order to to fulfill that. So that is probably one of the largest challenges we have. Thank you very much, Jorgen. There's, there's um, I suppose, a, a similar question that sort of leads on from that from Terry on the Isle of Mull. He wonders how circular is Holland's economy? It's not very circular, and, and that is probably pretty good, I would say, because an island uh, uh, is depending on having income from abroad. You need to have export, and, and our export industry, it's quite good. It's for, for islands, it's, it's never enough to just change money with each other. You need to have fresh input into the economy, in a way. And we have, therefore, thanks to our history, probably been, been reasonably fortunate when it comes to gambling industry, which is not a very good thing. But in this case, it is, because all the surplus from our gambling industry goes to the good cause. It's not like private uh, uh, companies who are all over the world. It, it goes to the good cause, but it's it's big today, both in Finland and in Sweden. Our ferry industry is very large. Our banking system has gone on export. So we, we have been trying to encourage all those who are doing business in Orland to, to not stay here, but to go abroad. So in that sense, we're we want more than a circular economy when it comes to our to our local economy that is very circular on the other hand so there is the mix between export and our local economy and we're probably pretty good at that it's been very very popular to buy second hand nowadays everyone buys second hand i'm not sure how you do it there in in, in in Shetland, but here it's 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 become extremely popular. Facebook and um, and this uh, uh, auction sites, it's great. I bought a saw yesterday; that was a bargain. Do you have a waste disposal problem? Mm, not really. Yes, yes, we do. We do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Sorry. We don't have the problem here because we export all the waste to Sweden. So we don't see it. So it's not a problem in that meaning. But it is a problem that we do not have, a, for example, an incinerator and take use of all this waste to make energy out of it. And those who are engineers, engineers are very often wrong, aren't they? But they claim that it's too little in order to to be be viable for for the, the for for creating fuel out of it so no it's not a problem because we export it to sweden but yes it's a problem because we should probably use it better thank you thank you jürgen well we we have a, a sort of timetable that we need to keep yeah. up uh, to but um i think if if kirsten could uh, ask a, a quick question and then a uh, Matthew and then we'll, we'll move on to the next the next session so Kirsten Sure, thank you um so my only experience of Holland is uh, the ferry berthing there at about three o'clock in the morning on my way to Estonia um but I was interested to find out about um your the fact you've got 16 municipalities we have a lot much um kind of larger scale of of kind of local governance um in Scotland so our smallest municipality is 82,000 where I live, you know, that's the smallest kind of local government structure. And so I was really interested to know how that's managed. And also then, is there a lot of reliance in local communities on volunteer effort? Or is that all managed within uh, the delivery of services and um, kind of provision of, uh, yeah, of, of ferries and services? Is that all managed at government level in the really kind of more outlying areas, or is there a reliance on volunteers to do that? Mm. The the lesser the municipality is, the larger is the will to help from the local community. Our our smallest municipality is one hundred person, one zero zero. 
and there is no way on earth that they could take care of all the legislative stuff that is needed for a municipality, but they still do it. So there is a system of when when the the government of Åland pays out money to all these uh, different sixteen municipalities. There is a, a mechanism saying that the one who makes a lot of money has to provide those who doesn't do that as much. So there is a sort of, of Robin Hood over it, where, where, where we take from the rich one and gives to the poor in order to keep everything running. The smallest municipalities, those are out in the archipelagos. And I'm very glad again now, Lori, we have to be friends. You go travel to Shokar. Shokar is the most beautiful place in the world, actually. Um, that, that's my place in the summers. And, as, and tonight it will be my place as well, because we go there by the ferries later on tonight. We have six, six archipelago municipalities. And although they are very small, they are between 100 and 400 people, each of them even though they are very well functioning and important for the uh, people that lives there. While Mariaham with 11,000 uh, inhabitants, they have a much larger organization in the municipality. But it's, it's, probably, it's probably not as uh, important for the average towner for the average guy in town, because they, they see the municipality very seldom. While in the archipelago, the, the, municipal, the office of the municipality, that's the hub of the archipelago. So that makes things staying alive, if you, if you, if you say it that way. And, and it's I very nice thought... to see that Shetland has an incinerator with 23,000, either Either you can't count or we can't. Um, I, I, th I think I know what the problem is. <laughs> can I can I just really quickly ask then? You said that the less you mean in the lesser municipalities, smaller municipalities, there's more willingness from the local community to help. Is there a willingness, or is it that they have to in order to survive? What's the difference? One one. Um, you can so if I lived in a city, I could volunteer to be part of my community if I wanted to and help out with things like infrastructure and this local shop and things like that. But I don't need to. If I don't do it in my current community, these things won't exist. That's the difference. I believe that it's a matter of perspective. Because if you do live in these islands, it's really not an alternative for you not to take part. So there are really no options. And that's my question in what's the difference? Because if you have made your choice to stay in that smaller community, you probably do that because you are prepared to help and to assist. If you wouldn't be prepared to do that, you would probably move out, which is maybe what's happening in the in the overall development where people tend to live to leave smaller societies and uh, go the to the cities. Will have to do so much absolutely um well we'll move on from very interesting questions there kirsten and uh, it's stacy next so stacy hi there hi Jan. great presentation hi. that was wonderful it really brought back memories because i used to live in denmark i lived there for a while i lived on Fun. So oh. the memories of the ferries and, you know, I went to the island of Bonholm and I thought it was really, it's really interesting to see, have those memories come alive again. Um, <laughs> I was, I was kind of listening to your presentation from a kind of a post-colonial Caribbean perspective and it was really shocking and interesting to hear you say that Holland wanted to belong to Sweden because coming from an island perspective where we strive for autonomy, I mean, we really do as much as we can to establish an identity outside of a center, whether it be a, a, a you know post-colonial metropolis or anything like that. So I thought that it is a shame that you say there is a kind of a an exodus in the diaspora from from Orland. I think. Um, do you think there's any way that building that sense of autonomy could help to bring that diaspora back or help to create a better sense of identity? 
Yes, and and I, I I don't want to be misunderstood really because the Orlanders wanted to belong to Sweden when this happened in 1920s, after the 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 forming of the new Finnish nations and everybody was a little bit nervous and our cultural links were much stronger to Sweden than to Finland, mm -hmm. so that was the the background why why it was people were worried at that time. Uh, and the disappointment when the League of Nations made its verdict, so to say, was huge. But what they said, the leaders at that time, was not moaning and not complaining and not saying that this wasn't good and so on and so on. They said, guys, it's time to work. And that's what they did, actually. So although you weren't really pleased with everything, their perspective was that this is not the time to moan, this is the time to work. And over the years, there are still but very, very, very few here on Åland who would like to, to go back to Sweden and to have, a, to, to have them as our motherland, in, mother country instead. But that won't happen anymore. The youngsters, they share for Finland in ice hockey. The links between the commercial links, the trade links are much, much stronger to Finland than to Sweden. Although still people are more often studying, youngsters are more often studying in Sweden and we know more about the Swedish society than we do know about the Finland society. So it's a very, it's a very complex reality that we're staying in. But I would say that there are very, very few who doesn't want to have it this way. So at some time they said that we are not Swedes and we don't want to be Finlanders. We are just plainly Orlanders. Thank you. And uh, excellent. Well, um, final question, if you make it uh, short, Matthew, that'd be great from you. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering, um... Uh, to, how, to what extent would you say that the constitutional status in Holland is um, sort of somewhat settled now? I'm sort of thinking of comparisons with, uh, for instance, sort of Faroe or Greenland, where autonomy has kind of led to continuing debates over independence. So is, is that a feature at all? That is a very, very good question. We would like to be more like the Faroes, because their autonomy used to be very similar to ours, but they have expanded their rights of uh, of making their decision over the years while we are in quite a few ways we we are standing still we have over the last five years been in negotiations with the new act of autonomy for Holland uh, in regard with finland but that uh, it's very little left of it when it comes to our wish list what should be in it it's very, very little left, so I doubt that it will happen at all. So the largest things we've had over the last 10 years is, is that, that we had these new financial systems, which is a little bit, it's a little bit sugar added to the, the, the previous ones. But it's a better system and it makes us a little bit uh, more well off uh, financially. But in in autonomy way, we have been we have been overtaken by by pharaohs, and and we we would like to have more more influence when it comes to to our daily business. It's still it's still good. It's not that, but it could be much much better. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jürgen. Lots of things for us to to think about and uh, to consider uh, for the Scottish Islands. And um, thank you very much for, for spending some time for explaining it to us. Uh, thank you. It's, it's always very inspiring to hear what you're, what you're doing over there. And um, yeah, we will learn the lessons eventually. Thank you very much and good luck in your future discussions. Thank you, Jürgen. All the Thanks. best now. Bye. Right. Bye. Right. Okay then, uh, folks. So lots to, to think about there. Um, what a different situation the Orland Islands are in compared to the, the Scottish archipelagos. 
and the individual uh, Scottish islands that are represented uh, here today. But um, I would imagine that there are there are things there that are relevant to to all of us uh, to consider. Um, so we'll move on to the next uh, stage. So it seems odd that you can't keep two things going at the same time. I wasn't aware of that. So um, on the Slido. So thank you for those who have contributed to the first question um, for this session, which is how would you rate the current relationship between the Scottish Islands and the mainland? And now the next one, um, which is a uh, running and um, is coming up with a very interesting result, is for those with experience of Scottish island life, to what extent do you think that the Scottish Government currently understands island needs? Okay, so there's some interesting uh, results there. Now, uh, Leanne has told me that I'm not able to, uh, that I haven't been sharing the results, but what I'm doing is I'm cutting them and putting them on a PowerPoint, so I'll be able to share them uh, that way. Um, or there is a boat, there must be a button somewhere that I can also uh, press. But don't, no worries, I will get the information. Uh, oh, actually, you can see it as it's running. It's just not the, or can you? Active poll. You should be able to see. Andrew, you should be able to do that in slido.com. You will, and if you set up your document, I email you, it'll show you exactly where to click. Okay, okay. okay. I will do that. Um, but while I'm, um, while I'm trying to figure out that, uh, what we want to do next is to break into some some groups because you've all been sitting there uh, absorbing um, very well, and um, we're a little bit behind hand, but we'll we'll make up time, so there's nothing to worry about there. We'll go into our breakout session number one, which is discussing the current situation. So um, the idea is to just meet randomly. You'll be selected randomly by the computer, um, and um discuss the uh, the current situation from your perspective either from looking from the outside looking in or from being at the heart of this uh the, the current situation the relationship between the islands uh, and the mainland and um within each group if someone would like to uh, note down the um the thoughts of the particular group and then we'll have a, a full discussion in 10 minutes time a, about what people have have thought and we'll open another text poll um, where we can collect this information so let's see if i can do this i did try this before so breakout session um cannot edit breakout session assignments because okay. someone else is editing them it was me let's have a look uh, just create the four breakout rooms now andrew okay Two, three, four. I wonder if four is too many, actually, because we don't have a huge number of people. What do you think? One, two, would three be better? I think three would be better. Okay, so we'll make three sessions, three uh, groups, create assignments, and participants automatically allotted. Um, okay. Yeah, just hit create. Start breakout session. Okay, and what about yourself and I? And, and oh, I'll just, I'll just say, put Daniel, are you there? Yes. Daniel's there. Why is he not going in? Oh no, there's just me and you. I'm just going to pause the recording, okay? Okay. I don't forget. Yeah, and just to tell them that it's going to be all breakout sessions will close in 55 seconds, so it's a minute and it counts down. And where do they add their question their questions? Well, you have a, a, oh. um, at the moment. I can see that you've got comments from the breakout session. One waiting for votes. Oh, votes! It's not votes. It's, it's okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an open text thing. Open text, yeah. My oh my, this is a learning experience. Good group though. They're very um they're engaging with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what you want. And I want to make a PowerPoint of all the stuff so that I can show the people in the afternoon. That's the other thing. What we'll do then once the session finishes for the break, we will stay in this call and we'll do a few saving uh, 
settings. Welcome back, folks. <laughs> I hope you uh, all went into um, conclave um, and managed to have a chat with each other. Uh, I couldn't see what was happening, so uh, eh, it's all a mystery to me. So now um, we have been fiddling about. Leanne has been showing me stuff, so I will be able to show you the results of the um, responses before. But um, at the moment, what I'm going to do is a share the screen and you should be able to see comments on the breakout the first breakout session about the current situation a uh, appearing at least that's what i'm reliably informed so um i believe it so let's see um leanne is watching as well so once a uh, type uh, somebody has actually posted something we'll we'll see something there but just to say, uh, feedback, how was that? Was, um, we'll be doing it again. Was it okay? A bit more time. We were just really getting into it. <laughs> Thought that may be the case. But um, we, what we want to do is uh, divvy up our time so that there's plenty for thinking for the future rather than griping about the, the present. So let's see. But it was a great conversation in our group. Yeah, same here. It was good. So a bit, yeah, a bit more time would have been, would have been great. So next session, yeah, if, if possible, have a bit more of a, of a time. We need a, yeah, we need a bit more, I think. Well, that's good. Okay, I will yeah. divvy up the time differently for our next recap session. This is a bit tricky. It requires people to type very fast. I'm happy that Stacey volunteered to do it in our group. <laughs> I just took notes on paper, so now having to put them on. See, that's, that's, so did Stacey. That's even worse. Yeah, I'm really, yeah, I'm her typing. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what the priorities of each of the um, groups has been. So I'll start scrolling down. And if you just uh, have a look, and then we'll open the floor for comments and thoughts. In fact, we can do that now. So um, while, while I'm scrolling down and uh, you can have a read, um, who were the reporters, as it were? Laurie, you put your hand up first. So what was the, what was the, um, the main focus of the the short discussion. Well, basically, we had um, people from Tasmania, Ireland, as well as Scotland, and um, <clears throat> talking about the similarities with um, uh, the metropole um, remote areas and how, you know, you might think of the big enemy as Westminster, but then when it comes to to um, devolving down to um, the um, <clears throat> Uh, Edinburgh area still they always that becomes the center and so you're always no matter how far down you go you're never going to be represented because it's always the center you're always feeling like they're not taking your unique and distinctive characteristics and needs into consideration you're being lumped in as all one or it's a very urban rural um, divide and making policies that are nationwide when they aren't applicable to an island and Kirsten mentioned something about the 20 minute thing that's going on in in Scotland that is just unrealistic for islands to everything to be able to to live your life within 20 minutes of each other so it's you know those and also in the remark about the size of Scottish um, the, the municipalities just being too large to get your head around and actually know everybody and know everything that's going on so I hope I, I captured most of what we talked about yes okay thank you um, 
And I think uh, one of the things that's really good about this collection of people that we have today is that we have people from the 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 larger island uh, municipalities, polities, councils, whatever you want to call them, and representatives from the other islands um, who don't have that um, a layer of, of government structure, but actually connected to mainlands as well, as far as local government is concerned. And sometimes I feel they get left out. So it's nice to see you representing Mull, etc., who are actually here uh, today. Um, and I think that might be what uh, James uh, was was uh, alluding to there. Well, we had Anne in our group, but she has just stepped away for a little bit, and she immediately made that point, which I thought was very important. Um, so we, I think a lot of our conversation devolved. It was really two separate conversations. If you're attached to a mainland council or you're a independent. Uh, council. Thank you. And then uh, Daniel, you've got, uh, well, you are a fast typer. That's uh, that's impressive stuff. Yeah, no, it's just, um, obviously, I, I work generally on the rural um, sector, but um, there are obviously many similarities between islands and remote communities on the mainlands. So, um, a lot of my research is looking at the uh, effects post-pandemic whether they be good or bad on these communities. And these are just a few of the thoughts that I've thought of. So, you know, pandemics had an impact on tourism industry uh, at the start. And, you know, it's starting to return to normal um, access to healthcare. Um, the pandemic highlighted um, the issue of uh, the uh, healthcare situation on remote in remote communities, whether it be mainland or islands. Um, and that was another thought that I had. Um, Supply chain disruptions, obviously, supplies are harder to get, and uh, mental health, that was another aspect that came into my mind. And obviously, with the digital connectivity thing, islands have probably seen a little bit of a spike in remote workers moving there. Um, and uh, uh, there is a question whether this will remain as a long term uh, trend or people are going to re return back to more urban environments. So these are these are my thoughts. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And um, I can see Sandy's posted there as well about um, community council reform long overdue. Um, needs to be properly funded. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then Kirsten, some areas of the Scottish government have an understanding of islands, uh, but yes, the twenty-minute neighbourhood thing that's uh, not entirely relevant to us, is it? So that's important to to point out. And Adele, okay. Ah, well, indeed, this 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 question again of uh, the islands that aren't part of the big three. Yes. Um, Adele, any comments? Yeah, I was just in the same group as James and uh, with Anne as well. But we also discussed, you know, kind of what, what democracy might look like and how, where that creates conflict as well, depending on whose perspective is being there. Uh, you know, uh, we're viewing it from, um, and then laterally, just as it ended, we touched on, I suppose, James was talking about how uh, other areas in Europe approach kind of representation, even in, in small communities. And then obviously uh, with Brexit and the support from the EU with kind of local um, community groups has um, severely reduced and not just funding um, and that structural support, but legitimacy, you know, with kind of higher or upper tiers of uh, of governance through through Scottish government up to the EU level as well. Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Stacey as well. Hi there. Hi. Yeah, we had a really interesting discussion, and we did look at. We had a you know myself and Gerard were the only islands who didn't have mainlands, so it was interesting to to listen into what was being said. So the discussions came from a research perspective and a historical perspective as well as sociological, and it, there was the sense that a lot of issues are still creeping up or still coming up. There hasn't been much um, advancement when it comes to the idea of autonomy and creating a coherent sense of aut autonomy in the Scottish Islands. Um, there was the observation that COVID-19 actually did kind of present that. There was that that kind of, if there is a good thing about the pandemic, it was that sense of, of collective voices and coming together. But that push for autonomy has kind of fizzled out a little bit. And in as much as the Island Act has 
provided a kind of outreach for islands. There was a really insightful comment made in the discussions regarding still the sense of alienation felt by rural communities to the metropolis and that the, the wish that there was this kind of outreach and inclusion for rural communities. So there is a push for outreach and to empower islands, but it, it's not taking into account a lot of the nuances of the current situations and what's happening. So on that, that's kind of an overview generally. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that's excellent stuff. Um, and then we have uh, Malcolm's comment there, which is uh, relevant to all island uh, archipelagos, I, I think, um, that the, even within somewhere like Shetland, islands can be, you know, become taken over by parts of the, the mainland. And uh, yes, Bressa lumped in with North Lerwick. Is there any particular um, ramifications of that, Malcolm? Um, I mean, I, I guess the, the first thing is um, that the, none of our councillors actually live on the island. Um, the, so they're always visitors and, and they, they do turn up. But I mean, what they tend to turn up for is events because the, there's there's things happening. Um, and they, they kind of do their best, but, you know, I wouldn't want that job. You know, I wouldn't want to try and represent um, half of um, a fairly sizable town um, along with an island because the the people that live in Lerbeck don't actually care about ferries um, because they don't need one. Um, but it is our lifeline service um, and the needs are, are very, very different. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, Kirsten, I think you've got comment there yeah okay. it was just i was just going to type something in the chat there but it's absolutely um on that bressa lerwick level is it's the same level as i live in a hybrid local authority so we have helensborough which is literally just down the road from glasgow and we also have places like collinsey which are really take a long time to get to and it is that thing of the difference for me between a hybrid local authority and an island's local authority Island only local authority is with a hybrid local authority, you always start with your bigger populations and then think about smaller populations, whether that's remote, rural or island communities as an afterthought and a problem to be solved. Whereas in island only local authorities, islands are just the bread and butter and they're the day to day. And there's still obviously those issues with looking at those more outlying islands within island local authorities. Um, but that's that's kind of the challenge, I think. Well, many issues here um, to uh, to consider, and I'm just okay. I'm conscious of time, but I think we we can see what some of the the problems are and um, some of the, the the gripes that people have. So I think it might be um, a good time to actually move on to the next uh, part of the session, which is starting to look at um, futures. How do we sort of make things better? And the the next uh, breakout session is well one that we will look at um, meh or poor scenarios or in the the, the Shetland a uh, two thousand eleven um, sort of, uh, account in a rights lister. So um, I would like you to have a chat. Let's make it fifteen minutes this time to give people more of a of an opportunity to to discuss. And um, let's let's look at the potentially negative futures that might be awaiting us in 2050 if current trends uh, or negative trends uh, continue. Um, so keep your um, your powder dry for the the third session where we look at sort of uh, high aspiration um, futures and how we might get there. But let's let's look at the. Uh, what it might be like from a negative perspective in 2050. Um, so we will just open this up then, breakout sessions. So we've done the same way. So um, choose somebody to, to report and uh, to record the, the thoughts and uh, we'll put them into the, the Slido afterwards. And um, I'll click this uh, this material so that we can um, present it uh, later on. So okay, let's just do that. Start breakout sessions. So be as negative as you like. Okay, this this is the really um, 
disastrous futures that we're, we're thinking about um, if things don't improve. No, nope, can't say we don't try innovative things, Leanne. Eh? And as if by magic, everyone reappears. So, okay, right. Well, let's let's get uh, let's get torn in then. Um, what are these terrible scenarios that we're going to be facing in 2050? What I've done is I've taken out some of the um, uh, the questions that we we don't need. But what we want to do is um, note them down and then um, have a a poll on recommendations on how to avoid these particular um, negative outcomes. So uh, if those who have the uh, the wherewithal to start typing this stuff in, that'd be great. Otherwise, if people um, don't aren't typing but would like to comment on what they've just heard or what they've discussed, that'd be great too. So um, I'm sure we can do two things at once, i.e. listen and type and well, speak. That's three different things. So if anyone uh, wants to um, make a, a verbal comment about what they've, they've been looking at. Oh, Kirsten, there we go. Hi, Kirsten. Yeah, you don't sound surprised. Um, the, uh, no, I was going to say, because I was halfway through a comment there when we cut out, um, basically we, we'd been talking about the Disneyfication of islands for tourism and also um, the kind of uh, designations of islands. So having these places as um, scenic areas or national, you know, the uh, golden eagle areas and that kind of restricts it. And what we're seeing potentially in a negative scenario is an extension of that to green leads. And so seeing basically another way of seeing these islands is there's not really anybody there. So let's go and do the thing that we think is important over there. And that kind of um, impacts on opportunities um, for, for development, um, but on endogenous development, but also diversity of development in these areas. Thank you. So the, so there'll be more green lairds uh, in the future in the islands, yeah. And I see, um, yeah, Terry, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, I was just a little bit chilling that it is so, it was so easy to be negative about the future because the trends are to have falling school rolls and rising number, rising proportion of the housing stock uh, becoming unaffordable to local natives. Uh, so, and then compound all that with climate change, give us another pandemic and let's just see who survives. I think we did very well in the pandemic on islands by and large, uh, but I, I don't know if we'll do so well with extreme weather events. Well, that's, uh, yeah, interesting. It was a chilling experience. So. Uh, anyone else have that that feeling? So everyone's depressed now and wants uh, wants to finish early and go and have a cup of coffee. Stacy. Oh, oh my goodness! Yeah, it was it was a very um it was a good conversation. It was good for us to air what we were thinking about connectivity, and we thought that all of us, no matter what island region we were from, could relate to the problem of connectivity or that being one of the major issues. The foundational core of our discussion was around lack of connectivity and depopulation lack of connectivity obviously from the point of view that it increases economic empowerment if there's a way that people can travel back and forth one of the remarkable comments in our breakout room was the fact that there is a private ferry and i apologize i forget which region it was in but it's run predominantly by private business and so it shows there is the economic capacity but 
we see there being a lack of political will sometimes, you know, from a, you know, a more honest point of view, there's a lack of political will to, to allow the empowerment that comes from connectivity. That was something we noted. We definitely noted as well, um, John in our group was mentioning the, the, the really chilly scenario, not just of depopulation, but that shift in the demographic where young people are leaving, the population stays the same. You have retirees coming, so you have mainly an older population. And there isn't obviously the sense of creativity and the sense of, of cultural dynamism and diversity that's kind of needed to build resilience. So um, it was it was a really it was quite revelatory. It was a good discussion. I actually don't think it was that negative. It was very insightful. It's a good way we can now turn to think about solutions. Good stuff. I'm just wondering, um, when, at what age do you cease to be innovative and imaginative and creative? <laughs> That's a good point. That's, that's true. Uh, said he, who's feeling less imaginative and creative uh, every every day. But there we go. Um, Seven, 17, Andrew. That's about the cutoff point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that. that's long gone, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, great stuff. Any other? Anybody else want to voice something? To... Or are you just concentrating on what was what was written? Good. I'm glad it was a a, a constructively negative uh, Very good. discussion. I, so I wanted to can sorry I to say I wanted to draw attention. Laurie's comment in the chat about a really beautiful phrase: the disnification of islands when they're taken over by tourism is definitely something that we can relate to in our part of the world, and it does seriously dilute that cultural mm -hmm. heritage. So that's one of the worst case scenarios of the future, that your culture and your sense of identity has been so diluted that it's very difficult to forge a path into the future and, and reimagine what can happen. Yes, indeed. Well, there's some really interesting um, comments here coming out from your, your discussions. Uh, there's also uh, Malcolm's one related to the change in demographic as well. Um, significant decline could be that there not being enough potential students to be able to maintain further and higher education in the islands. But of course, that's a particular uh, that's particularly important for us who work in um, the tertiary education in the uh, in the islands. But indeed, um, problem with ferries. My goodness. Well, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Ferries. Always a problem. Always a problem. Okay. Still some typing going on. Um, yeah. Right. For me, it was just very interesting because a lot of the future scenarios I thought were actually just contemporary ones. <laughs> These are all things that we're all experiencing now and just adding to the transport. We talk a lot about ferries, but um, I was shocked recently. I was trying to book a flight for my family off the islands uh, at the start of April, which is, you know, uh, you know, three months in advance or so, and it was nearly £900 for a return trip from here to Edinburgh with my 50% discount as an island person. So I think we're already at the stage where cost is prohibitive <laughs> in terms of coming on and off. But, but we were there in the 90s in, in Orkney. That was quite a normal occurrence. Normal families didn't really travel by air transport as well. So I think yeah, it was just interesting to see how close we are to that future <laughs> that we're planning, that we think about um, um, being a, a far ahead, but actually it's it's right here at the door now. <clears throat> was there, indeed, uh, well, that's a good point. Were there any scenarios that were discussed that are, aren't here yet, but uh, are sort of worrying people? We did discuss the economics, really, because you know that's still the currency of the of the of the day when we're talking about funding everything. Um, yeah, Anna's just popped it up in the comments there. Um, you know, yeah, it's cheaper now to to fund kind of it would be cheaper to fund depopulation of some of the islands than it would to continue them ongoing uh, at the rate of decline that they're here at, at the moment. We discussed that, and then also, um my particular bugbear around, you know, childcare and family dynamics. So it's it's not just enough to have jobs. And even if you had housing, you know, there's that cultural element of what people do when they get here and how families are supported. Because there's one thing if you're retained as an islander and you have a family network, but if you're moving to an island and you don't have that natural network around you, how easy is it for families to feed into this kind of supportive network around 
additional childcare because it's we don't have any additional childcare outside of school hours at the moment in Orkney. Um, there's no wraparound care or school clubs or or private nurseries to take up that, you know, uh, between, you know, when you have to get to work and when you end work in the day. So it's not just, you know, providing schools, which we're struggling to do that. It's also that whole cultural element of how families fit into the area and that expectation of, I think, st still gender normative roles that may, may appear on the islands um, still. Um, yeah, I, sorry. I did mention um, sea level rise also um, thinking about weather and climate change and some of these islands that may be infrastructure destroyed or landscape seascape Prince Edward Island ex experienced a huge post tropical storm last September and it knocked out power for 16 days here for many of us or here in my house and um, it, it tore away all the, the North Shore dunes and so thinking about Scot Scottish islands, maybe you aren't, uh, you, maybe your places, your houses and infrastructure aren't as close to the sea or they're up on a high rock and you don't, but there's still all of those other things about climate change that I think are really, really frightening. So that kind of got me very depressed. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't have to look far for uh, negative uh, futures, that, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, well, sea level rise, Laurie, you, you know where my house in Scalloway is, and it looks out over the sea, so uh, it won't take much for um, the front room to be a paddling pool, but, uh, you know, fingers crossed something will be will be done about that. Um, this, I, I had a, the next, the next poll was going to be recommendations to how to avoid these futures. Well, actually, of course, that's uh, unnecessary because the next session is going to look at that. So, um, with these, um, Sort of problematic futures, uh, even the the ones that are just a development of what we are, we're, we're facing just now. Um, yeah, are are, are um, a, yeah, w very worrying. Can't get my, my words together just now. Um, so um, instead of thinking about recommendations just just now, let's move into the breakout session on, on high aspiration on, on got the grip because that will include recommendations on how we might reach a much uh, better uh, future and also think uh, this is the time to think um, sort of over the horizon so uh, as I said planning maybe takes us to 2030 in the sort of extreme case 2040 but um, what might we do if we we're doing something really um, innovative um, what might be achieved by 2050. For example, um, the reason that um, I wanted Jürgen to speak to us was that um, perhaps there are communities in Scotland that would like to follow the, the Orland Islands down the, the route of autonomy. Um, or maybe there are other uh, things that people would, would like to do. Um, so we will, well, still one participant typing, we'll wait until that um, bit of typing is finished and then we'll have the next breakout session and uh, we will imagine um, good futures, but also remember we have this um, the, base, the basic theme of politics here. How might the relationship between the islands and Edinburgh and London um, be manipulated to our benefit? So it, it's not just um, building better barriers to stop the, the sea coming in or whatever. What, what do we think about the, the political situation? Um, to give us a better and brighter um, future. But of course, I mean, put the other things in as well, if you wish. But let's see if we can come up with um, some high aspiration political uh, changes that we might like, and then we can take them into the afternoon uh, for the next group of people who are going to be um, sort of joining and, and, uh, and watching. And uh, in the interim between this final uh, breakout session, and the afternoon session, I will be printing off the, the findings and this, the points that we've been made and turning it into a, a PDF and also a, a, um, a PowerPoint that we can that we can show. So um, let's do that. I think yeah, that's that poll. We can deactivate that poll. So there we go. Thank you very much um, for that. And okay, I will open up the next one. I don't know if you can see it if you're in the um, the breakout session or not, but it'll be ready for 
when you come out. And I'll stop sharing that just now and we'll go into this. High aspiration futures. You can have a little bit longer on high aspirations if you if you wish. Or if you feel you would you like a, a little bit longer on high aspirations? Okay. I don't know if we go back to the same uh the same groups, but that's all right. Give me another five minutes, because uh that was my if you and Andrew, instead of setting it to automatically let them manually choose what breakout session they go into. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, we have all been ending up in the same breakout session. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay. I'll do that again. Okay. Uh, what's that again? It's still a little bit. Right, another five minutes. Here we go. Um, <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm looking to see if there are lots of happy faces with this uh, exciting new future that we're we're all going to to share. Um, so let's, um, let's see, what do you imagine in the positive high aspiration, uh, 2050, what are we, what are we going to be like? So as before, start, uh, typing in, um, your comments and then those who, um, would like to orally voice their, their comments, um, please do as well. And then we'll still have time, um, after this, if recommendations are not part of the comments, we can have a, our final Slido for uh, recommendations, which we can then punt to uh, BBC Radio Shetland and BBC Scotland and all those sort of people who are interested. And uh, Janelle's heading for, for bed. Yes, Janelle, it's been great to, great to see you. And um, Want to share your screen again? Um, was it not sharing? Okay, no. I thought, it, thought it was sharing. No, okay, okay. It says two on it. That's funny. That's funny. And that shared. Buttons do something funny. Yeah. Seems to think it's sharing. I'm going to stop sharing and try again. Let's just see. So it's stuck somewhere. Share. No, it's not letting. Oh, what's that? Hang on. Ah, it was off this edge of the screen. Apologies, everyone. Right, here we go. Screen two. There we are. Uh, I three screens, two's not enough. Yeah, perfect, I can see that now. There are three excellent suggestions there from uh, Ruth and from Ruth's session. Is anyone just uh, not convinced at all that there's a, a good future awaiting us? Uh, but we have to have to have something aspirational to aim for, and then think about how we get there. Thanks, Laurie. That, that's what we need. We need to blow our own trumpet a little bit more. We we tend to uh, think we're not doing as well as we should. But yes, thank you. So, distance and distributed learning uh, is a, a very important thing. And the Scottish Islands then should start thinking of themselves as part of the North, the High North, as a part of that. And 
since John brought us back to the, the main theme of, of today's workshop. Yeah, autonomy and confidence. Yeah. Because we have to think of, recommend how do we get these things? How do we achieve excellent connectivity, affordable housing? Can we do it within the structures of governance that we have today, or do we need to renew those, develop them, and have new ones? Following other island exemplars. Um, are you looking for uh, written comments or or um, actual comments, Andrew? Uh, uh, just. Um, an oral comment, uh, John, would be great. Yeah. No, in terms of uh, funding, uh, I made this point in the breakout session that, you know, good connectivity, better ferry services, uh, tunnels, um, better housing, uh, sustainable development of our economy. A lot of these things will take very large amounts of capital investment. And uh, there is no question at all, uh, and people have done the analysis, that the Scottish islands benefited disproportionately given the size of our population from European funding and all of that's gone and if anyone thinks that the European funding levels will be replaced from the, either the UK government or the Scottish government um, I'm afraid that's for the birds so if we are going to get the capital investment that we require to deliver all of these essential parts of our future infrastructure rejoining the EU is, uh, in my view, absolutely essential from an island perspective. Interesting, yeah, very good. Um, but how well, we don't have to think about how realistic that is because it's recommendations of thoughts of the future and recommendations. So, um, further discussion is how is that achievable and is it possible? But that's uh, perhaps for another another day. It's uh, picking a, 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 a a simple recommendation like that. So to achieve what we need to get back on course, we need to join the EU. Hi, hi, John. I, I'm I'm slightly surprised to hear you say that in some respects. I know you're quite close to the fishing community, and that was the one part of the Shetland community that was quite keen on Brexit. Do you think that the the um, the mood has changed, uh, and do you think that that the, the change is enough to potentially make a shift back to Europe? viable within a reasonable time frame? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the important point to make is that not all the fishing community voted for Brexit. Some did, uh, many didn't. Um, and it was clear that Shetland voted very decisively not to leave the EU, notwithstanding the importance of fishing. The experience has been that uh, not all of these uh, grand promises that were made have been delivered. They never were deliverable, in my opinion. Um, so I don't think anything hugely different has changed. Shetland didn't vote to leave the EU. Scotland didn't vote to leave the EU. How realistic is it? Um, you know, in UK politics, it's not on the agenda. And I don't want this to descend into a political discussion, but there is uh, there is one route back which is very clear, uh, an independent Scotland will rejoin the EU. Um, so that's whether you agree with that or disagree with that, that is a route back. The point I'm making is that uh, if we're going to get the capital expenditure, we need to um, really reboot all of the infrastructure and all the capital investment we need. Um, we're going to have to look to Europe to get that. And we're not going to get that if we're outside. So, from an island perspective, membership of the EU is so important, in my view. I'm kind. Of, I'm kind of heartened to hear you say that. And I would. I'd extend it beyond just um, investment, money, monetary investment. Uh, actually, quite a high proportion of the students that we had that came to Shetland from outside um, of the Isle actually uh, were European students. Uh, and I think uh, Shetland was quite an exciting and interesting place to come to from a European perspective. Uh, and that again, that's been cut off. We have very few European uh, students coming in now. Um, so I, I think it's, it's part of the answer in terms of social renewal as well as, as capital investment. I totally agree, Simon, absolutely. 
Angie, can I just ask what's happening from a logistical session point of view? Because obviously we were due to break at 12.30. We've been here three hours this morning and some of us have got three hours this afternoon as well. So just so I know what's happening for yes. lunch and comfort break. Yeah, um, we're just going to um, break uh, now and uh, come back at half past one. Of course, uh, you don't have to stay for all, the whole time and we might we might finish earlier uh, as well, but it would be wonderful to continue our discussions and I will um, uh, turn the comments, etc. as I say, into a PowerPoint and we'll run that through uh, this afternoon and you can, you can further comment on um, the recommendations and, and the ideas and we'll have the opportunity for those who are just streaming in to ask questions as well. And it will also start off with um, uh, Stacey and Gerard um, telling us a little bit about their own um, uh, Gerard's ideas of uh, um, a island sovereignty, Islandian sovereign, sovereignty and what that is and the relevance to, to us. And Stacey is going to talk about a other um, a Island examples of of uh, looking to the future uh, from her experience uh, in island innovation. So yeah, so we'll come back. So I think we'll we'll draw things uh, to an end just now, um, and you will get a chance to see all the the comments and all the the thoughts uh, now that we've mastered that technology. So um, if there's any other final question or thought that somebody wants to get off, say now before it gets too late and they forget, Terry. Yes, I just wanted to say uh, that there will be a role for the UHI to teach people on islands how to build their own houses, how to install solar panels, how to install heat exchangers, and how to run their councils better. So the UHI, we do need a local vernacular learning academies for islands and those are the particular skills that spring to my mind in a hurry that at the moment there's nowhere to learn these things on mull a very good point yes there are two good points one about the uhi and the lack of uh, the opportunity on mull yeah um okay well us within the uhi that's something for definitely for us to to consider and think about um okay let's i'll just stop sharing that poll now and right um well i think uh, that final high aspiration one that included the recommendation so we don't need to do a, an extra uh, text poll for that and um i think it just uh, Good point now for me to just say thank you very much indeed for your contributions so far, your thoughts and your ideas, and um, hopefully this uh, you found it um, useful as well to hear from other people coming from different uh, different perspectives and different um, uh, different worlds, uh, as it were. So if you would like to take part in the afternoon, that'd be great. I, but I know some of you have got other work, you've got other lives, other things to do. Uh, but it would be wonderful um, to see you this afternoon as well and uh, to hear further um, what you make of, of what you've said uh, this morning. And um, I won't uh, hold you back now because I know you've got things to do, like have lunch, etc. So we will reconvene at half past one. So thank you very much, everyone. Andrew, that's in 35 minutes and we use a different Zoom link, is that correct? I or believe there's a, there's a different Zoom. Uh, well, WebEx link, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's right, Leanne sent it. Okay. That's right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Okay, I'll see you later then. Bye for now. See you shortly.